I'd like to call to order the school board meeting for the, um, met, <laughs> the 10th of March, 2015. And if you would like if, to join us for the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you. First order on our agenda is to discuss any adjustments to the agenda. So far, I'd like to announce that item 5B, the Stand Up, Speak Up training, although we were really looking forward to it, um, we are unable to get to that this evening. Are there any other adjustments to the agenda? No? Okay. Seeing none, um, may I have an approval of the school board minutes? Uh, I move that we approve the school board minutes as listed in our packet. Second. Second. Discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Thank you. Item three, comments from our student representative. All right, I feel like I have a lot tonight. Um, just looking back in the month, um, it's kind of our first real stretch of school in a while. We really appreciated those snow days, so thank you, Ms. Nato. Um, we took the survey about Cape schools, and I think you guys are going to be getting the results from those soon. Um, just a little recognition for the winter sports. I know we have a lot of fall sports here, but in the winter we had boys basketball win, and we had our first pep rally, which went really well. The boys swim team won states, and the girls ski team also won states, and I know that all the other teams did very well. Um, the flash chat sequence is going well. I've got a lot of positive. Oh, if you don't know what flash chat is, we have guest speakers come in and kind of give inspirational, kind of like TED Talks, but not quite like TED Talks. Um, they're just, I would call them unofficial TED Talks, come in and um, share with us their life story or something that's a little inspirational or different. Um, and it's a nice break in the day and I, people have really enjoyed going to them. And the theater department put on the dishwasher, which I heard was extremely successful. I didn't get a chance to go see it, but everybody who went to see it really enjoyed it. Looking forward, we have SAC president elections so up, coming up this Thursday and Natalie, who's not here tonight, is running as well as Lexi Backey. Um, the prom fashion show, everybody should go and bring their kids and support them. It's this upcoming, not this Thursday, but the Thursday following. And winter sports are coming up, and the end of third quarter is coming up faster than I think most of us would like it to. Oh, and we have Maker's Night coming up, and I know that a lot of students are volunteering at that if they're not participating. Maker's Night? Maker's Night is, are you going to talk about it? I will talk about it. Okay. Perfect. Feel free. Um, well, Maker's Night, I guess, is just any student who makes something, and it's focused on the STEM, so it's science, technology, engineering, and math. But um, I know they're doing a lot of science demos, and it can be anything basic from a water pump, which Mr. Thayer had talked to us about, to um, like very elaborate robotics. Cool. That's it. And that's it. Thank you. Um, item number four, are there any comments from the public on this evening's agenda items? Okay, seeing none. Um, communications. Uh, I understand that we have just a few recognitions this evening. We're our state representatives. We're actually and starting before that, Before we that? have a, a student recognition. We're recognizing fourth grader Emma King. And I think Principal Hassan is here to Ooh. introduce her. <gasps> no? OK, well then, perhaps her art teacher, Mary Jane Johnston, would like to introduce her. And they'll come together. So this is Emma. King, this is Emma King, and Emma, you're 
much more famous than me. Um, Emma won, um, or Emma was recognized for um, Youth Arts Month at the Portland Museum of Art and for her amazing piece of work. Do you want to, do you remember the name of your work? Do you want to say what it was? Past and, I mean, present and future. Oh, the artwork was a mixed media piece. It was photography, it was a self-portrait, and half of it was um, photography, and the other half, Emma drew her future self. Do you want to describe it at all? You don't have to. I don't really, I don't really know how to describe it. Emma, Thank I you. saw it, and okay. it was really nice. It, I can tell why um, they picked it. It was just beautiful, and you're very talented. Thank you for sharing it with us. Okay. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Congratulations. That's pretty special. Okay. Thank you for that. That was really amazing. Um, and we do have other recognitions for our high school sports teams. Um, and I do believe we have some proclamations that will be read by Representative Monaghan Derrick and Senator Millett. And not just for athletics. No. Did I say just athletics? You did, but I know you didn't intend to. I didn't intend to. <laughs> this of course is Cape not. Elizabeth, after all. We're a well-rounded <laughs> community. Good evening, everyone. It's great Good. to see you all again. It's, uh, as I have said previously, um, this is one of the best parts of our job, I think, Definitely. is being able to recognize the amazing work of, of our schools um, and, and elsewhere. I actually have a couple that um, hopefully I'll be working with the town council on. But we are here for the school board. So um, if I just can take a second again and just thank you and the district for the amazing work that you do. Um, it just uh, fills me up when I hear um, and learn about all the amazing, creative, thinking outside of the box things that are going on in our district, from flash chats to the Maker's Night to, um, oh, I, I, it's just endless. But, you know, your st mission and vision, your strategic plan, your benchmarks, thinking about the whole student, inspiring them, helping them find their passion. Um, and recognizing the importance of STEAM, not just STEM. Um, it's just a, a real credit to our community. So thank you, everyone and the staff um, and on the school board for everything you do. With that, we are about to embark. Um, I, I was just sharing with folks earlier this evening that um, we single-handedly shut down the publishing of sentiments um, in the State House <laughs> because there's just too many and they had to focus on bills um, and that's all because of Cape Elizabeth. <laughs> Uh, we will be able to print up more in probably a month or so, but um, l at least we got in under the wire. So we're going to start with um, the music program. As we all know, it's just one of our gems, uh, starting e in the elementary school and all the way through high school. And as evidenced by this evening, it's just a testament to the talent that we have on staff and that they are able to, to nurse. As we read the names, we recognize that probably all the students aren't able to be here with us tonight. There's a lot going on tonight. There's a number of meetings for sports teams for the spring. Um, so we're just going to read the names of the, um, the musicians who've been honored as part of the All-State. And um, then we'll hand them their, um, their sentiments. So with that, Leo Wing. Come on up. Congratulations. Well then, have these. Can you stay up here? You want to read the next one? Sure. Uh, next is Aaron Dobietsky. Yeah, but I can just give them to Jeff. Okay. Okay. And we have um, Sam McDuffie. And then we have Cole Carpenter. Clint. 
Claire Zimmerman. We have Blair Carpenter. <laughs> Natalie Gale. Kate Hansen. <laughs> Zoe Shalat. <laughs> Will Stiles. And Kate Oberholzer. I'm not sure, but I think this may be a record year. Um, for the number of kids that um, yeah. 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 so congratulations to all of you. Okay. Okay. So next up, we actually, um, Principal Shed, would you like to join us? <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> okay. So. Even though I just mentioned STEAM, um, we have this evening a, a recognition of a particular accomplishment for the Cape Elizabeth High School. Um, we're, I'm going to read the fancy language once, um, and then after that we'll kind of leave that out because it can, it can get a little laborious and um, take up a lot of time. So. Uh, be it known to all that we, the members of the Senate and House of Representatives, join in recognizing Cape Elizabeth High School, which has been named the 24th best STEM high school in America by the U.S. News and World Report. STEM stands for Science, Technology, Engineering, and Math. We extend to everyone at Cape Elizabeth High School our congratulations and best wishes. And be it ordered that this official expression of sentiment be sent forthwith on behalf of the 127th legislature and the people of the state of Maine. Given this 24th day of February 2015 at the state capitol Augusta, Maine, signed by Michael Thibodeau, President of the Senate, and Mark W. Eve, Speaker of the House, and it's sponsored by myself, Representative Monahan and Representative Hammond. So congratulations. So next up we have the Cape Elizabeth mock trial. Um, this, uh, they won the 2014 Maine State High School mock trial championship, its fifth championship victory in a row. Um, the team will represent Maine at the National High School mock trial tournament. Members of the team include Matt Dennison, Sam McDuffie, Sierra Bates, Maddie Connolly, Rosie Stevens, Sam Moran, Ali Stewart, Walker Grimes, Rose mm, Bally? Bailey, sorry, Ben Stanley, Zoe Shalott, Montana Braxton, Leo Wing, Woody Chang, Chang Luke Gilman, Lori, Lauren Holmes, Chloe Gilman, Dan Howard, Emma Schoonover, Drew Harrington, Sarah Keniston, and Jack Stewart, and coaches Dick O'Meara, Jonathan uh, Sarbeck, and David Hillman. We extend to all members of the team our congratulations and best wishes, and that goes with all of the members of the 127th legislature as well. Congratulations. Kim, we have one other coach. She's standing right there. It's Mary Page, one of our teachers. Yes. Okay, thanks. After they start reprinting them again. Okay. Okay, and next, the Cape Elizabeth High School Girls High School Volleyball Team. If there's any members, please come up and join us. Great. So, congratulations to the Cape Elizabeth High School Girls Volleyball Team, which won the 2014 Class A State Championship. Uh, I understand that they have a way of making their games very interesting and uh, it's particularly challenging in the championships, but um, 
quite impressive how they didn't give up and fought to the very end. And so here we are, recognizing um, the players, Monica Delaquila, Emily Lynch, Hannah Sawyer, Annie Ball, Maddie Bow, Lydia Brenneman, Phoebe Coburn, Katie Connolly. Mm -mm, I can't read that. Something de Grandis. Do you guys know what that? Pua. Pua. Pua de Grandis. Tess Holler, Maddie Murphy, Monica Shindell, Rose Punsky, and Maggie Dan um, Datum, and Coach Sarah Bethel. <laughs> so congratulations. <laughs> Last one. This is our last one, the Cape Elizabeth Girls Soccer. So we want to come on up, ladies and coaches. And we didn't get anyone. Okay. So we're here. I'm very happy to honor the Cape Elizabeth High School girls soccer team of Cape Elizabeth on, on winning its 2014 Western Class B Championship. We extend our congratulations and best wishes to the members of the team on their achievement. And on behalf of all of the members of the 127th Legislature, congratulations. These are all set. just <laughs> okay. Okay. remnants. So thank you, everyone. Thank you. It's amazing to see how many of those kids appeared on more than one list. We've got some busy. Yep. Yep. And I, I we will be back given the recent performances of our teams this winter. So you always you bring bearing of good news. Thank you. That was funny. Thank you again. So item 5C, legislative sentiments. We just wrapped up. We just We're wrapped up. We're moving on to 5D. So exciting. And I see we have a presentation on our school nutrition program. Peter Esposito is our school nutrition director, and he's here just to talk a little bit about the food service program. And you might have noted that in your packet, we included um, the results of our most recent food service audit. It's the first time that's been conducted since I've been here, I think since you've been here as well. No, the first, the first year I was here, but it's changed drastically, right. yes. So, um, okay. Um, if, if anybody's seen the news, they know that the, the standards have changed in school lunch. Um, we were a little bit ahead of the curve with making the changes so it wasn't so drastic when it came um, to the final rule. So we, um, I guess instead of getting into a whole nutrition um, lesson, but we have to adhere to certain guidelines for amount of protein, amount of grains, amount of calories, and an amount of sodium is what the new, newer guideline is. So we have to have every, every item that we serve or make has to be at least 51% whole grain. So all of our recipes had to be changed to have whole wheat flour, at least 51% of the flour had to be. Um, also our calorie counts, for example, um, K through five students, the calorie count can only be between 550 and 650. It has to be in between there. At six months ago, there was a, a limit on the amount of grains. There was a minimum and there was a maximum and you couldn't go over it. They've relaxed the grain maximum, but not the minimum. So this is something that we've, we've already had, had done and worked out. Our review went very well. Um, we had a few things um, that was more logistical and where our, where our equipment is set up that, you know, we're, we're working on to create, um, like for instance, a salad bar at the middle school in Pond Cove is outside of where the cash registers are. That was one of the things that we got written up on, but there was no actual power or any way to change it. So that's something that we're working on. We've met with uh, facilities and um, we're going to try to add some power and change, change where, where we're serving that to adhere to that. Um, also, 
um, with doing all these new guidelines, our costs are up probably 20% on just food cost. Um, that's not only um, just the food, but our labor is up. And also for the sixth year, I think this is my sixth school year, we're self-supporting. We haven't received any town money um, that's including salaries, benefits, any kind, anything that's bargained in the contract. So we've done that for, for six years. It's getting a little tougher. Um, things are more expensive. Insurance is going up. So that's all things that came out of our budget. Um, also some highlights that we've had this past summer was the first summer that we had a summer feeding program where um, we opened it up to the, um, the rec department and the summer school students um, to, to buy breakfast and lunch. So we opened our salad bar up and also we partnered with uh, instructional support and we had um, some students that I actually worked with closely. We planted a garden. We, um, I had two students that worked in the cafeteria with me learning culinary arts and um, two of those students did go, end up going to paths this, this year. So we worked very closely and we hope to, to make it bigger this year. Um, we've already been in talks and I think I talked with John last summer about it that I would like to till up where the raised beds are by the high school and you know plant a lot of things this year. So. Um, that's something I'm going to ask to talk to Bob Malley and see if we can get that, get that going. Um, so the, not only the garden that we worked with, we also went on field trips. We went to Elwives Farm. We went to the farmer's market. We had the students pick their food and make sure that they had all the components of a meal and actually prepared them. So every day that they worked with me, they created their own lunch for the day and it adhered to all the guidelines, so they learned that. Um, also, um, this year, we're, we're doing something a little different. We're gonna try to, for Literacy Week that's coming up, we're gonna have students send in their recipes from their favorite book. Um, we're gonna try to menu those items. I know we're gonna have a lot, but, um, so we're going to try to menu that to make it fun for that whole week, and, and, it, and I'm assuming it's going to extend longer than the week. Um, and then after that, we're because we've got a lot of interest with the students, and we had partnered with um, uh, Pond Cove, and I had applied for a grant for creating a culinary program for um, elementary school. Um, we did get the grant, so this coming fall, we're going to have a 12-week program and we're gonna have as many students as we can, 12 at a time, and I'll work at least two days a week with them after school and have this program where they're gonna create um, meals going by our guidelines and, 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 and so on. Um, also, um, with the grant, we had generated a lot of interest and there's a lot of TV shows that have the cooking challenges. So one of, one of the things that we've been working on, we had been talking about it for a year, but this year I think it's gonna happen in May, we're gonna have a cooking challenge with CAPE students. So we're gonna partner, um, we're gonna see how many applicants we get, we're gonna create teams, and we're gonna, and I'm thinking it's gonna be probably on a weekend, and we're gonna partner maybe older students with younger students, depending on skill set, to even up the teams, and then have um, chefs from local restaurants come in and judge the, the food based on, you know, our nutrient analysis, our guidelines, and, you know, the whole, you know, taste and look of the plate, but it's going to be the tray, not the, so it's going to be a school lunch. Um, I, I, I guess that's it. Uh, the only thing that I would, I would stress, um, you know, the self-supporting the self part, we do include all of the salaries, benefits, our equipment repairs, everything. So it's been out of our own with no, with no allocation from the town. So it's getting tougher and tougher to do that, but um, we, we've done it this long, so we hope to continue. So. Oh, John. Oh, um, sorry. <laughs> Um, we haven't met Peter, but your uh, reputation precedes you, especially in, within the Pond Cove Parents Association. Uh, I've heard a lot um, about 
you and your passion and your willingness to share that with the community and with students. And the grant you spoke of um, was, I, I heard about it from the beginning until it, it got passed through the Punk Code Parents Association, PCPA. And I'm, I'm just, I want my hat's off to you. It's, it's so exciting and I love that it's multi-aged and you're gonna, I know that the grant's gonna try to open it up to as many students as possible. And also um, someone who's a big fan of yours, Eileen Hetrick, yeah. um, told us at one of the last meetings that um, you've agreed along with, I guess, guidelines that you have to follow that you're gonna eliminate all high fructose syrup? We the have none. Yeah, you're not, but you're going we, to. we have already done that. Oh, you I have those corn syrup. We we've eliminated that from our whole program, and that was probably um, last year, I think. But we had gone through and made sure that nothing does have that. Yeah. So she was very happy about that. And to have yeah, and there was a, there us. was a couple of other things like, for instance, a pop tart, a whole grain pop tart right. does meet the guidelines, but um, you know the calorie count and all that. It's and it was something that was asked to, you know, if we, if we could try to remove it. So I just assume have them have a hot breakfast than, than that anyway, so. Thank you very much yeah. For, yeah. for everything. The moms in the room really appreciate it. <laughs> Don? Uh, I wanted to ask about the, the summer food program. You said yep. that you reminded us that the, the food program receives no subsidy from yep. the school. You're responsible for your own P&L and, yep. um, and congratulations for, for uh, managing that for six years. That's fantastic. Um, is, is the summer program also self-sustaining? Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, the, we do not have enough free or reduced students to actually qualify to have a subsidized program. Like our school lunch right now, we have enough free and reduced students where we would have, um, we get so much money for them. We, do, we could not sign up for that. We'd have to open it to the public and we don't have enough students in the district to actually do that. So we would still serve the meal for the price of what our normal lunch was. I guess what I was trying to make sure I understood was that the, the summer, the, so the summer program also receives no subsidy from the school, yes, that's the correct. school budget. That is correct. Um, so you were, able to, you were able to start a, new, a summer program last summer for the first time and, and with, that, with no new cost to the district? Yes. Um, but on the revenue side, you are, you're, you're regulated in terms of what the price for meals can be, right? Yes. Okay. So it's, it, it's all with the, with the food costs. You have to watch what you're spending, what you can create with, with what, what we have. So in trying to make it appealing and also healthy. So. Well, thank you. Perfect. Hi. Love something if you're thinking about fall and the cooking challenge. Yep. I'm working with some other townspeople on the 250th anniversary of the town, and we're hoping to do a, har a large sponsored harvest dinner this fall. Mm -hmm. So if um, we could talk perhaps about partnering with the Cape Farm Alliance. Sure. Actually, I forgot to mention that we had uh, during Harvest Harvest Fest. That was another thing I donated. I cooked uh, some of the food for the for the program that they that they served out of the school. So I'd be more than happy to help it's out. Really just an honor of two fifty to really highlight the relationship you have with the local farms. For sure. Farms. That'd be awesome. And I mean, Al Wives. We we purchased all our produce from Al Wives. From actually, I had met with them last spring and um, made sure that they could handle what we needed and they planted more more vegetables this year so we actually were able to purchase vegetables from our wives until November nice. so I'll call you. <laughs> and, and that's not easy to, to do as I understand because you have you can't stop feeding kids in November you have to find other suppliers who you can work right. with Right through the main winter, when so we when had we had a plan. Okay. We had a plan out what we were what we were going to plant because one of the things that I said that they had some hoop gardens and whatnot. So the lettuce was a big thing, and that was the thing that was getting towards the end of it. Um, all the root vegetables, which usually come out at that time, so that had sustained us. But the tomatoes and the lettuce was the tough thing, and luckily they didn't have a frost too early. But then after that, we were able to pick up from from our other produce. Purveyor. Um, I want to congratulate you. When you were listing all the things to do for kids, I could not believe that all these various programs and tasks and competitions and so forth you're teaching them. It's really amazing, and, and not to make light of it, but when I, 
was in school, the best I can remember is having sloppy jokes. I can't yeah. remember doing 90% of what you do. And I, I think it's amazing. I, I, I think it's a great teaching opportunity and a life skill for kids, and I really congratulate you. Thank you. Well, I believe it's a classroom, too. What we're, what we're teaching is you know, something that they're going to carry throughout their life. So they ought to have the, the best information that they can, and you know, that's what we're here for, ultimately, well, I, as the kids. I agree with you, and I congratulate you. When I, I just made the comment that I barely got edible meals when I was in high school, and to see edible meals in, in teaching is unbelievable to me. Well, it's definitely changed. <laughs> Peter, um, I think Pop-Tarts are probably the same as the Doritos. Will you tell me the difference between the school Doritos versus the Doritos? Re reduce fat. Reduce fat, lower sodium, and less calories. And then will you just go over, how do parents find out if they don't want the child to buy a la carte? They can call either myself or one of the managers and they can put a note on their account and say, you know, no a la carte purchases or no. So that means the bill, and then is the bills also, um, they're not itemized. So much we, on we, a la carte, so much as hot food. We, we can itemize. You can, yeah. We can so they can find out exactly what they're purchasing. Yeah, that's great. Um, that's a great thing to have. Um, I think that's great. And then just to follow up on what everyone else has said, I don't think there are too many other schools who are, self, um, who are taking care of their own business. Um, no. In our area, no. No. You're doing it. You're making it happen. Um, a, lot, a lot of the districts, neighboring districts, at least put in the insurance benefits for, for the district or they uh, pick up the director's salary or something like that, but we haven't had to do any of that yet. Thank you. And you're coaching baseball as well? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much. Just two, I think two, might, might be more um, brief comments, but one of the things that came up during the audit, and Peter won't say this for himself, but the woman from the state was calling the day before, you don't have enough, la I don't have enough labels, you're missing some of the labels. Um, because she was expecting, as she deals with in most of the schools that she visits, tons of product labels for everything that was being served in the kitchen. But the reality is we don't have as many labels because we make a lot of our items from scratch. Right. And I don't, I don't think people understand the scope of the work that happens in our kitchens. And as you point out, David, it's not what happened um, in the kitchen that, of the high school where you attended or the elementary school where many of us attended and you know that takes a tremendous amount of time and skill and it requires uh, you know peter's skill set in um training and managing people thank you um, and that's something he does extremely well because it's certainly easier to buy something pre-packaged if it already meets all the guidelines but it's it's not as good right and our participation rates are what they are which contribute to our being able to self-fund because we prepare a lot of our food locally yep um, and Peter, you know, Peter won't toot his own horn, but he volunteers an awful lot of hours to do this, some of this outside work that he's describing with students. Um, you know, that, that after school program that he's planning to do for 12 weeks next year, he doesn't intend to be paid for. Um, he's doing that because he believes it's the right thing for kids. And, um, uh, you know, that's, that's why we value um, him in that <laughs> thank, room. Thank one you. of the many reasons. Um, I guess I have one more question. And, um, Mary, the you might be able to answer this. How do we do for seeking students who need, um, who, to apply for free and reduced lunch? I know that we put it out everywhere, but the other pieces, do we have with the social workers and guidance? Yes. Uh, an outreach. And when, the one other piece that someone brought up to me was when they're putting in their application, is it um, kept secret and private and Yes, that's, that's the law. Right, but like to the point of, you know, not passing it through the, and there's nothing wrong with passing it through your teachers. I mean, we're all take care of it, we're all confidential, but to the point that um, passing it straight to the main office. People can it. submit it directly to Peter. Most, most of the applications that I receive are in an envelope that are addressed to me either through the mail or through the office that are in, in clo you know, a closed um, envelope. Um, I, I don't think I've received any that, um, have been just passed in to a teacher or something. And as far as the, um, 
going uh, with the social workers and all that. They, I, I see these people all the time, so they say, oh, Johnny, you know, what do you think, Johnny, and I get, a, get me an application, do they have a, you know, a main care number or something like that, and we'll, we'll work it out. So. And I think that works both ways. You know, our, our food service staff have the ability to sort of, you know, bring to Peter's attention, geez, we've noticed a, a pattern here with a particular bill. I'm wondering if there's a concern, and Peter's able then to pass that on to administrators so that they can pass it on to the appropriate right. person to make outreach to those families. Thank you. I, I knew you were doing it. I just wanted to make sure that uh, we talked about doing it. Um, that way and that everyone knew it could be, it could happen as confidential. Yeah, and I mean, we, we try to get everybody in that, that needs it, Thanks. for sure. Well, Peter, um, if I may say in summary that if we had to put your performance up on a job performance rubric, I would clearly say that you exceed expectations. Oh, thank you. And I'm so, I, I'm getting a little misty at how you have just embraced doing food service in a school system, in a community, and how all that can just tie together. Because truly what really happens with students every single day doesn't happen if they're not well fed and they're not understanding nutrition and they don't understand food source. It's a, um, it's a basic life skill and a need for many of our students in our community. So thank you for all you do. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions for Peter? Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Item 5E, retirements and resignations. Thank you. Um, so we've received three letters since our last meeting. Um, Pond Cove teacher Karen Abbott is retiring after 18 years uh, working in the district. Karen's a first grade teacher. Uh, high school college counselor Belinda Snell is retiring after 28 years in the district. And uh, director of instructional support Jane Golding is um, resigning effective the 22nd of May of this year. And um, that's after four years in the district. So to be clear, Jane can't retire twice, right? That is accurate. <laughs> Just want to make sure. Because if you could, I, I'd want in. Um, <laughs> thank you. Yes. And thank you to all of those who have put an, those number of years into our district for service. Yes, um, and as a reminder, um, and I know we have at least one new board member, but the board recognizes retirees typically um, at the end of the school year um, with a little recognition in May. So there will be an opportunity to speak about them and at that link at that time. I just do have to say that it, you'll be missed, Jane. Thank you very much for your service since you're in the room, and as well as the other um, two teachers. They've, your dedication to the schools is amazing, and uh, we real, I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. Um, item 5F, the superintendent's report. OK, a few things going on. Always. I'm going to start with one that we thought we had heard the last of, but unfortunately we have not, which is school calendar. <laughs> so in order to maintain compliance with the PATH calendar, um, because we have um, at least one district in our group who's not able contractually to have students start school prior to Labor Day, we've had to adjust the start date to after Labor Day. That will make that so that's a four day change in the start of school instead of start well. I thought it was before. Instead of starting the first of September, so it's a yes. week's change, um, but for four school days, we will be starting school the 8th of September. Um, again, I haven't included that for adoption this evening. I'm sharing it as informational with hope that we can adopt this calendar at the meeting in April. Um, you'll note that that makes our last day of school with snow days, with snow days, the 24th of June. The high school graduation remains the 12th. So that's, so those four days, August, excuse me, September 1st, 2nd, and 3rd, those three days, will now move to June. So I have a question that maybe Principal Shedd could help answer because I think that this often affects families towards the end of summer, trying to stretch out those last summer days. Does that make preseason longer? Yes. 
So it's not like we can extend our summer vacations if we have a high school athlete who participates in summer sports if they wish to participate in preseason. Oh, so you're talking about the spring season? The fall, fall preseason. August. Somewhere around. Sure. Thank you. So when I talked to Jeff Thorak, who's our athletic administrator about this, he actually saw a silver lining, um, which is that if he can arrange it with some of our, um, the schools that we compete with, it gives us the opportunity perhaps in that first week in September when our students normally would have been at school to see if we can arrange some of our longer away contests um, during that week, um, the Freibergs, the Yorks, and those sorts of things. So he will try to do that, uh, but it may be that a number of other schools will as well. But we, he, but it does present at least that opportunity. Um, That's an interesting to reduce the amount of lost class time for kids. Because the main principals association isn't going to waver on when they start preseason, and I know that our fall sports are going to be anxious to begin training. So taking advantage of that extra week is interesting. It is interesting. But it is interesting. interesting. It's a possibility. Thank you. So that's, that's uh, the first. What did John? you say the last day is? I'm sorry, June? Uh, 24th with snow days, if we use all five snow days. With snow days, OK. Yes. So could I ask one question about that? So high school graduation is on the 12th? That is correct. So the, so seniors, what do the seniors do after they graduate? I assume they don't come back to school for two more weeks. That is correct. So they th never have. Right, but they don't usually have two weeks. They usually of school do after because, graduation, do they? because they, they wouldn't have, under the other calendar. They would have had days. one week of school after graduation with with snow days. I don't believe so. Are you asking if seniors then have enough student days in school? Well, Steve, I'm thinking both about um, senior student days in school and about teacher teaching days mm -hmm. or teacher student days, which are, uh, you know, uh, which are an important part of our relationship with teachers is, is mm -hmm. teaching days. We did have some conversation, and again, this is relatively new information, but we had some conversation yesterday about the potential impact on STPs and when STPs might start, because AP senior exams, sorry, thank you, okay. senior transition projects, um, because AP exams are typically wrap up in mid-May and then we begin the senior transition projects. It winds up that we sort of have an, essentially an extra week there, so we need to take a look at how those schedules might adjust. And I think that, that plays into your question a bit, John. It's not unusual for us to have this amount of time after graduation. Um, you know, what, what varies, as, as Jeff points out, is sometimes the amount of snow days. This year, for example, we have, I think, nine days um, between when seniors graduate and when the official end of school occurs for non-seniors. Okay. So I also suspect that part of your other question was what do teachers who only exclusively teach seniors, what do they do when seniors leave the building? Is that also part of your question? Well, I suspect that there's few of those who only teach seniors, but, but I, I don't know. Um, but yes, I was thinking about teacher work workload as well. Do you want to speak to that at all? I, I, there are a few who are exclusively teaching seniors. Um, I'm not, I, I'd have to check, but I, at, there may be one. Um, typically there's no more than one or two who teach only seniors. That would be really unusual. And I, I almost think that this year there may be none. Um, but really that the particular issue is not new. Um, and what typically happens is once uh, the senior transition project um, begins with seniors, then disproportionately uh, it is teachers who have disproportionate loads of seniors who sort of supervise, make contact with, us, with the senior transition project site coordinators and those sorts of things. So they're, they're, they're quite busy and, and, um, and 
doing productive educational things, I would say. But again, I, think, I, I, can, I can check if the board would like to know for sure, but I think it, it may be one this year, if one. Okay. Thank you, Jeff. Yep. <clears throat> Just a practical question. I know we uh, originally adopted in February, and you know, there's other districts change, so uh, it's, you know, we'll approve it, or hopefully approve it in April, but uh, do we have all the data? Or just so, so, so people so, to ask so we can understand. So the original meeting uh, between the partner districts was held in September. Um, there was good conversation. We thought there was shared understanding of the calendar at that time. Um, we learned last week that there was some discrepancy in that shared understanding, and in part because Portland is looking as well to adjust its calendar. It doesn't impact this piece. Um, so I think the, the seven Sunday districts are working pretty hard to identify and lock down the dates early and stick to that commitment so that we're able to maintain no more than five to similar instructional days because if we don't, it puts our state subsidy at risk and that's you know a substantial amount of money that I don't think taxpayers want to lose out on. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. So as a matter of process, um, is this a draft for us to consider as a board and then adopt again next business That's meeting? correct. So this is the final, final draft, right? Okay. Look across the fingers. Yes. One, one would always hope. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Any other questions on the calendar? Good. Thank you. So the second thing I have Sorry. for you, and this is cut off the presses today. There was an earlier version included in your board packets, but this is a revised job description for the college counselor position. Um, as I mentioned earlier, Belinda Snell is retiring from that position this year, and when we have retirements, it's typically our practice, or it is our practice, to review job descriptions um, for positions. This is a unique position in the district, and so we've included for you a draft um, of that job description. Again, I'm not asking the board for action tonight but this would be the opportunity to review it and submit questions um, to us prior to the next meeting with the hope that we would adopt it at the April meeting. Thank you, Meredith. This position is um, becoming, at least for, I think those who have been through the process, quite a crux is trying to get our kids through the college application process, the college search process, and being able to understand the many, many pieces that move along the continuum, starting even as freshmen and starting to scope it out, but then really heats up in that sophomore, junior year. And I can speak from experience that the guidance that this position has been able to offer um, our students and you know, maybe you want to say a thing or two about how important Belinda Snell's feedback is. The college guidance department is extremely, extremely, extremely important, and it's a very stressful process every single fall that every student has to go through. Um, I would even, especially with early decision and early action, which wasn't really a, a huge phenomenon. 10 years ago even, now I would say probably 85% of our grade applied early action or early decision, which is extremely overwhelming to students and Ms. Snell. So I don't, this is kind of a, just an idea, but I, didn't, I don't know if you had a budget for maybe two college counselors, at least in the fall, because it's a, it's a huge job to have 150 students writing 150 friends. letters, 100 and to put in the, and I, Ms. Snell did a phenomenal job. I'm not putting anybody down, but I'm just saying that it's hard to put in the amount of time that some students want to take. To take. When you consider that she's coordinating your references, her own yes, reference, it's helping you compile your job. list. I would say I probably spent close to 12 hours, over 12, over 24 hours on my home and application alone. That's not including the essay. So I can't imagine how she had to do that for 150 students. <laughs> so, yeah. I don't, it's very, it's a huge task. Awesome. Thank you, Sierra, for enlightening us on what that entails. Um, Meredith, it's yeah. 
this clean version we we just handed out the same as the a clean version of the red line one we have in our it is not. So it's it different. is an update from the red line version. I don't have it yet in red line form, um, but we will provide you with an updated red line compared to the current job description, not to that red line draft that you have. Okay, that's just easier for me to read red lines than Understood. it is to read the whole thing. Yep. Thank you. And, and just um, to answer here, uh, I, I, Jeff can correct me. I think most school districts doesn't have a guidance council dedicated to helping college. This is not something that Belinda came up with a number of years ago. We went out, we went out the first. There are a couple of other school districts in the United States. Falmouth has three. I believe, I want to say at least two. I think they might have three. There was um, a college counselor and two regular school counselors. Oh, okay. So maybe but that's what it. happened when there was a class of 200 kids, to your point. Mm -hmm. um, Maybe 30 of the seniors also worked with the regular school counselors mm -hmm. as a way of sharing those, that intense fall that you're right. talking about. And I don't know if that's a possibility that we could look at for other, for future years to have potentially Ms. LaPointe or Mr. Keenan work with a portion of the students, obviously a smaller fraction than this designated position, because I think that would allow for more one-on-one -on -one time because there are only so many hours in a day. Right. I think it would also add more comfort level when you send in your application. Just so you know, Sarah, the, um, having gone through this process helping my son, I never had this kind of assistance when I was in high school, but um, the, the wonderful thing of having somebody like Belinda Snell is she's unbelievably knowledgeable about things that nobody else knows. Um, mm -hmm. Having used a variety of them, she knows particular schools. She knows exactly what school might match up with a particular kid. Mm -hmm. It's not just the workload. She has a unique knowledge from years of experience. Mm -hmm. um, just the idea she came up for colleges for my son to apply, and I assume she says this for everybody, were unbelievable. I mean, they were perfect matches. And I think that's where the real skill set of a college counselor is. The Common App is not easy, but it's not dramatically hard either. And making sure things get done, mainly ministerial, the real skill is matching a kid with a college. Mm -hmm. Right, I agree. So I don't know, obviously there would be different elements to this, but if, for example, just the Common App section, because just having somebody sit down and look at every single word that you type, make sure that there are no grammatical errors, so on and so forth. It takes a solid hour and a half to sit down with somebody else and do that, but I think that having those sec that second and third viewing but from somebody else helps a lot. And there's also the coordinating of all of the things that need to go into Naviance right. that then get uploaded into mm -hmm. the Common App and making sure that those pieces are there and that they're quality when they are there. Mm -hmm. I agree. Um, Moving on. Moving on. <laughs> Thank you, Sierra. That was very enlightening. Um, included in your packet tonight, also as an FYI item, was the graduation report um, for 2014, as well as the five-year report for 2013 and the six-year report for 2012. Um, we receive these every year. Our graduation rates are consistently very high above the state average, as you would anticipate. Um, you can see our four-year graduation rate shows at 97.5%, our five-year graduation rate at 98.5%, and our six-year graduation rate at 99.25%. Um, again, we have students who stay um, as part of their educational plan for fifth and sixth years who may be marked as having graduated, um, and so that contributes to some of those percentages. Um, but overall, extremely high rates of work. <coughs> work people should be proud of. Any questions about that? Well, I would just like to say that this clearly speaks to not only a strong district in general, but also to a very strong administrative and teaching staff to usher our kids along that continuum. So thank you to the, all the hard work that happens. Uh, and also included in your packet was a letter from the State Department of Education um, just acknowledging that Pond Cove, and this was information we received last year, but that Pond Cove was um, identified as a monitor school 
this year, and that's under No Child Left Behind Act. Um, Pond Cove had a cohort of students who didn't meet um, AYP, or Adequate Yearly Progress Expectations for last year. And as you recall from presentations I've done in prior years, the, the state looks at cohort groups. So they look at students with disabilities, they look at socioeconomically disadvantaged students, they look at students from different ethnic minority groups. Um, our numbers hover every year, sort of right around the number of countable students at a grade level in grades three through eight and in grade 11. Um, we had enough students um, in cohort group that, those, that that data counted in the state report. It always counts for us locally. That's why one of our um, strategic plan goals is to close the achievement gap. So this doesn't come as a shock to us, but we did have a cohort of students who were identified as not making adequate yearly progress. And so as a part of our response to that, and again, this aligns with the work we're doing in our strategic plan, um, Punko is required to write a school in need of improvement plan. And the outline of that plan is spelled out in this letter for you, and once the plan is written um, by Pond Cove staff, we'll certainly share that with you. Um, you know, it's public information, but it, again, it relates to the work around response to, to intervention, um, art, you know, and, and other work that we've talked about over time, so. So just to be clear, the yes. not making it um, adequate yearly progress isn't um, student school-wide in Punko building, it is because that the average yearly progress gain has not been enough to close that achievement gap between our neediest vulnerable students. So yes and no. I mean, you, your whole school is considered in need of improvement if you don't meet those guidelines. So yes, we have a particular cohort group of students who didn't meet that threshold, mm -hmm. um, but as a, it means then that as a school community, we have work to do to close the gap. Okay. Are there any questions around the monitor school better? So, um, I, mean, I, I guess I would ask a question. Um, so how, how is supervision of this work going to be done? And I know that we've started, um, we've always had, uh, um, what is that word? teacher trainings um, to make sure uh, response intervention work we've done, we have done, uh, I'm blanking on the word, not teacher trainings, but um, professional, development. professional development. Professional development. So tell me, I know that we've always done professional development. Do we have, again, a professional development plan so to make sure that we have teachers going through RTI, RTI as well as all other um, you know, trainings that we need to. So if you look at page two of that document, it talks about what you need to sort of address as part of your improvement plan. And you have to, there are sort of three indicators as part of response to intervention. What's your identification process going to be for all students at risk of failing or in need of interventions? What's your tiered and differentiated intervention process? And what's your monitoring process? So you'll remember that this year was the first year that we had a universal screening in both reading and mathematics mm -hmm. across our schools. So again, we've begun to sort of look at what are that ident what is that identification process look like? There's been intervention, um, but we didn't always have the tools or th okay. the, the versatility of tools to monitor progress that we do have now. Um, you know, it, with respect to professional development, it's definitely been related to those pieces. We've done professional development with staff, and Kelly can certainly speak more to this, and or Ruth Ellen. Um, but, but there's certainly been work around how do you utilize the universal screening data? How, how are we monitor, monitoring progress of students? How frequently are we reporting out on that? Are we making adjustments if students aren't making progress? Because part of a response to intervention model is that nimbleness and flexibility, that if students aren't responding to an intervention, you don't use the same intervention for three to four months, right. that you make an adjustment after four to six weeks. Right. And then you try something new or different or you add more support. Because students don't have that time to waste and that's really what the No Child Left Behind law was intended to do. And while there are many pieces of that law that we may find um, you know, frustrating. It, it did do good work to promote the needs of all students in our, in our schools and um, give them the attention that they deserve. Thank you. So, Barbara? Just a quick question, and I don't know if you know the answer yet, Meredith, but for 
upon Cove to move past monitor status, one would normally look to the scores from this spring. But this spring is not going to be usable scores. So Correct. do you know what's going to happen to monitor schools in that situation? Um, Ruth, Ruth Ellen may have an update from the webinar yesterday, but I, I think that's still up in the air. And in part, that's up in the air because the, the state doesn't yet have an answer from the federal government around whether or not its plan will be accepted. Um, the state okay. received back feedback from the federal government that its plan was not accepted and that they needed to make some adjustments. Most of those adjustments were related to teacher evaluation, but the plan as a whole right. is, is on hold right now. So we don't know what will happen. So the waiver is based on, on the teacher evaluation piece needing clarification. Largely, gotcha. yeah. But still, that testing data, no matter what, is it going to be useful? That is correct. So we're anticipating that most schools will stay and monitor status until data is available next, next year. year. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. So another question just sort of occurred to me as we're sort of talking more about this and through this is, is the plan that they're asking for here um, in order to get Pond Cove off of monitor status, how is the work that they're asking for any different than the work that has been described that we should be implementing in our strategic plan that's already, should have already been in place in the school to close that achievement gap for the past year? Sure. Uh, well, again, you have to look at the expectations for student performance have continued to ratchet up. And so while we're working to close the achievement gap, the target keeps moving higher. So if we're here, we start here, and we move up, that's great, except now the target's here. Right. So, so, when we, so, so we're still trying to close the achievement gap, correct. and we've made growth, but not enough to close it because the target has continued to increase. So the targets and indicators of success higher, in our strategic <laughs> plan that we've put out, shouldn't they have been in alignment with the expectations then for the federal government's m uh, markers? And I, and I believe that they are. Um, we've made good progress in reading. Our, our student, the area where we didn't make adequate yearly progress was in mathematics. Um, and so I think it's an indicator that we, we've spent a lot of time and energy on professional development in reading in particular. We, you know, we, we adjusted and implemented a new phonics program foundations in K through three two years ago. We've seen a measurable increase as a result of some of that work. We're working on math, but we haven't seen that yet, the benefit of that. And we're continuing to do professional development around that. I spoke last month about work with uh, you know, Dr. Sharma, who was here to do some work with teachers. We've got consultants working with staff. Um, it, it's definitely an area where we continue to make some growth. You see um, in our budget requests to align our math curricula better with Common Core standards. So you saw a request for some updated materials that are better aligned with the Common Core standards so that teachers have the tools that they need in, in order to help students meet the standards that they're being asked to meet. So then to loop this work back so that we're not duplicating our efforts, then will this particular plan to get Punko out of monitor status be integrated into the strategic plan so that those two, I mean, they, the goals align, so. Yeah. I would assume so, as we update those action steps. The intent of those action steps is that the action steps are fluid. Mm -hmm. You know, our ultimate right. goal hasn't changed. The goal is still to close the achievement gap, and so that doesn't change. Mm -hmm. You know, to meet the needs of all students academically, so that doesn't change. And so, yes, Ponco, uh, you know, Ponco's working on response to intervention. Ponco's going to be continuing to, to chip away at that, and yes, their work around this will, will be their work. I don't know if you'd like to add anything. <laughs> <clears throat> Just to clarify, I know, uh, you know, when you say cohorts and use, you know, that terminology, so is it conceivable, and I don't know the numbers, but you have, you know, six kids in third grade that, you know, given, uh, you know, issues they have much bigger than academic learning, uh, you know, mathematical skills, you know, is it conceivable that they could make great progress overall and, you know, math in the big scheme of things is the least of their worries. So I always struggle with, um, you know, that might be one piece of it, but at the same time, there's a lot of different skills. I know it's, we don't want to say it's this group, but it's just hard, you know, when we hear this, you, know, you have so many hours in the day. So I imagine No Child Left Behind is extremely academic. It's reading and math. So our teachers only have X number of hours. So a child, 
that may need other skills developed, there's not enough time. So um, how do we I, I think part weigh of those trade-offs and how do we communicate that to a parent? Sure. Uh, I mean, well, in some cases, those are decisions made by individual teams for individual children on an individualized basis. So there's not a universal one-size-fits-all answer to that. Our, you know, our, our primary job is to educate students, and sometimes there are other things that do interfere with learning that you have to address before you can get to the learning um, in those academic areas. But I would say that we're also trying to fill those in, in other ways. So our summer program last summer, for example, was a way of adding some time to address some of those academic areas that, that maybe aren't getting, um, where students aren't getting enough time during the school year to really focus on those skills. We know that those students have needed more time. So that's a way that we've been trying to fill in that gap for kids. And I, I think it's those sorts of pieces that you, you utilize carefully. You're right. You know, there aren't enough hours in every day to give every child everything that they need. And that's, that's one of the challenges with No Child Left Behind. Um, but we think we can still continue to narrow the achievement gap that we see for kids and close it. And it's not, it's an achievement gap, but it's an opportunity gap for them in their futures and in their lives. And, and we have a responsibility to prepare them for future success. Thank you. Oh. I have no taking. Okay. Yes, I'm sure you are. <laughs> Sorry. My report's gonna take a lot longer. Okay. Um, one update that I wanted to share with you is that we have a van, or did have a van, in our facilities and transportation department that um, is no longer roadworthy. We took it off the road about a month ago. Um, so we've been looking at options for replacement of that van. We did sort of short-term rentals and gap filling um, to be able to utilize that. But it is our intention to purchase with funds that we had set aside in the budget um, to replace a truck. Um, maintenance vehicle in our facilities and transportation budget to instead replace the van that we need to transport students to and from school. Uh, we had held off on the purchase of the truck replacement due to other issues that we had this fall and some concerns about our budget overall due to the mold issues and some of those pieces and so we had held back on that purchase and um, while while we're still paying for the mold issues, um, we can't afford to continue to rent a vehicle. Um, it's much more cost effective us, for us to purchase a replacement. We've obtained a number of quotes from vendors and we'll be replacing that um, hopefully within the week or next week. So I just wanted to make that clear because you, you will note in your budget that, that there will be a truck in for replacement again um, and that is why. <laughs> we, we aren't gonna get to it this year. Let's see, a few Pond Cove items just to share. Um, Pond Cove celebrated, let's start with, Read Across America on March 2nd. And there were some crazy hats at Pond Cove as well as performances. And you may have seen pictures of the performances in the Pond Cove newsletter of Hooray for Diff and Doofer Day, um, featuring some incredible performances by Pond Cove staff members that uh, were a highlight of the day for many kindergarten through fourth graders. Uh, they also, on March 4th and following, <coughs> excuse me, worked on um, the Special Olympics campaign for Spread the Word to End the Word, which is a campaign to promote respect and awareness of students with um, disabilities. And um, the word that we are encouraging people not to use is retarded. Um, that's a word that, that at, with young children, is often sort of thrown around as, you know, a, a, an insult. Um, without a full understanding of what that word really means. And so it's, it's an educational campaign to help students understand the impact and the power of their language. Are we passing out hand uh, wristlets again this year? Uh, bracelets. They had stickers. No. Well, I, I, I love that campaign. Thank you very much. <laughs> we can tell you where to write. Thank you. OK. Um, Third and fourth grade students will be starting next week, I believe, bus tours of Cape Elizabeth as part of the 250th celebration and part of their research on the 200, 250 years of Cape and they're visiting sites like Kettle Cove and um, the Portland Headlight and a couple of others that I can't recall. All, yeah, all over town. March 20th will be beach day at Pond Cove, first day of spring, so mark your calendars. We hope it will Those be beach day for all of us. Freeze. <laughs> they still wear their winter jackets, but um, and that muck boots, I hope. That evening will be pon, uh, the Pond Cove Parent Association's beach blanket bingo. Beach blanket bingo fundraiser. 
is your speech training in action. Okay, smarter balanced assessments, and we spoke about this at the last meeting, begin uh, on March 30th at Pond Cove and run through April 15th in grades three and four. They are also beginning at the middle school for grades five through eight and at the high school in grade 11. And the high school students will be doing at least one Saturday for some of their assessments. I believe that is April 11th. Phew. Okay. Let's see. Um, can, I, can I just yes. something about that smarter balance? I was, I was uh, asked, I happened to ask Mike Tracy today, um, because I'm just so curious about this, the test, the smarter balance. Is it possible for parents to do a dry run? And he said, oh, yeah, yeah you can go to the website and um, do a test yourself. Yes. So we shared that at the last meeting, and the link to that site is in the letter. I believe that was sent out by the district about the Smarter Balance Assessment. I'll miss that. So let's posted on our <laughs> district homepage as well as on the Facebook yeah. page. Susanna, you can update us the next meeting on, on how you did. Well, I won't give you my score, <laughs> but I'll, I'll tell you how I did. <laughs> I can remember what it is. Mm -hmm. uh, if you haven't taken them, and I think I encourage people even last year to, to go on and, and take some of the practice assessments, um, it is, it's definitely worth doing. And I would encourage parents to do that as well as you as board members. I think it gives you a, a perspective on the kinds of work that students are being asked to do and the kinds of instruction that teachers are being asked to provide. Um, students are doing practice tests this week to help sort of build their understanding, not so much of the content, but really of how to use the tool mm -hmm. to take the assessment. Um, there are a lot of features that students may or may not be familiar with in terms of tapping the screen to make selections. You may have to move objects in certain questions. In some cases, you're using a split screen to read text and answer questions. So it, your tech Use, usage skills are, are fairly important for this assessment. Again, this year's assessment is really a practice for us statewide in that the scores, while they'll be used to help establish a baseline, aren't used for assessment of individual student or school performance. So, so to reiterate, just to make sure everyone's clear on this, that parents and families will not be receiving their own child's individual scores but the school will have a district wide. Not really. <laughs> no, okay, see I, I want to Not this clarify. year, no. So will the school get any kind of indication about how things went or is this all gonna be just poured into a state? Do you wanna come bucket? up and answer that, Ruth Allen? Exactly what our reports will look like is still being somewhat debated at the state level, which is always fun. Um, we are... Building the plane while you're flying. Uh, well, that's, no that's, comment. I'm, I'm, <laughs> so we, we will be getting some aggregate scores. We may receive some sample reports. They're still looking to see exactly what that's going to look like. Um, we are not going to have the same type of reporting that parents have been used to seeing with NECAP and with the SAT. Um, anything that we do receive would certainly be reported out, but I don't know exactly what that's going to look like yet. It's going to be different. And it won't be counted toward any type of grading for the school district or for individual schools. So we're figuring it out as we go. And it's out of our hands, right? It is. It, there's nothing we can do. We will get what we get. Right. And, and we won't get upset. That's right. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Easy to say. <laughs> I have one quick question. Uh, yes. So if, despite whatever shortcomings there were for the SAT being a measure of high school achievement, at mm -hmm. least it motivated kids to do well. So what? What is the Saturday of the high school testing, Ruth Ellen, that's going to draw our kids happily to in on a spring day to take a test? Okay, um, happily, I don't know that I can speak to that. Um, one of the decisions that, or part of the thinking that went into the decision was that the SAT had been done on a Saturday and students were given a compensation of a release day if they had come in for the Saturday testing, then they had a day off during the That practice will continue. So the day before 
April vacation, the 16th, would be available to juniors who've taken the test on that Saturday. Um, also looking to try to mitigate some of the interruption for the general schedule and the use where it's a one-to-one -one school and some of the strain on the network to do more of the computer adaptive test on that Saturday so that we don't have additional devices hitting the system all at once. So. And are we sure that that Saturday, I know this is a very basic question and I'm sure you've looked into it, does not in any way interfere with the SAT or the ACT or? It, it doesn't interfere with those. It is the same day as AuthorFest. So oh. we will have kids testing up in the academic wing and then they will be right there and able to pop downstairs and enjoy the offering. There's always a good yes. <laughs> Okay. Thank you, Thanks, Rachel. So continuing, um, it's also part of Read Across America Week. I did have the opportunity to read to our preschoolers, the Preschoolers of Community Services last week, which is also a great, a great time. They're pretty fun. We practiced riding elephants on roller skates when we needed a little stretch break. So they're well prepared for kindergarten, I would say. And there are 16 of them, I think, coming from community services to, to Pond Cove for next year's kindergarten. Uh, we had student trainings last week on the Stand Up Speak Up training. Again, we'll have some students coming hopefully back in another meeting or two to speak to you a bit about that. Um, but that's part, again, part of the ongoing work that was started with a grant through CIF for Steve West to work with Steve Wessler and again sort of empowering students to uh, change the climate within their school. We had last week, maybe Thursday, a parent night on internet safety that was sponsored by um, Hope and the Cape Elizabeth Poli Police Department. That presentation has been posted online just today, I think, so that information is there for people to access. Um, it, it is eye-opening, I think, for parents and was for parents in the audience to see some of the applications and the use of some of those applications, particularly among teens. Um, you know, and, and the reality is the sites that they're visiting change. Um, and so being vigilant about that, monitoring that, trying to educate yourself about what students are looking at, how they're using those tools is important. And it's not something any one parent can do on their own. Um, the presentation does suggest a couple of places to sort of look for resources of kind of what, what the trending sites are among teens. Um, the Cape Elizabeth Police Department is posting that as part of their Facebook page on, on a regular basis now. So those are just a couple of places to, to look for some additional information. But I would encourage you to take a look at the presentation if you haven't. I do think it, it is a reminder of um, what will I say? The, the May I? judgment of yes. adolescence. <laughs> Searching just, for the word. It, 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 in what makes um, an adolescent completely a blast to be around, there, there's no gatekeeping. There's oftentimes they're just after the thrill of the moment and really seeking some really fun and, and exciting experiences. And, and sometimes they, the, the barrier of where the fun and excitement might cross over into something that's not so safe. Um, is something that takes constant monitoring, not only by each child's parent or guardian, but by their friends, parents, and aunts and uncles and family members. Um, related to that, it takes my, a worldwide web. My book for the month of May, for people who are interested, is um, called Brainstorm: The Power and Purpose of the Teenage Brain, and I would Ooh. suggest it as a book to read with your teen. Um, I have to figure out what the date is. I think it's May 7th, but I could be mistaken, so give me a second um, for the yep. book group discussion. The power and purpose of the teenage brain. So I believe it's May 13th. It will be the evening discussion on that book. I often say that if it weren't for some crazy teenagers, no one would have ever crossed the Bering Straits. There you go. So, so again, worth considering. There's lots of information that we have continued to learn as neuroscience has evolved about how adolescents' brains work, and I think it's helpful to help them understand that as well, because um, they're living with it every day. <laughs> 
Next week, well, actually coming up this week, on Thursday night, we have the high school music concert at 7 p.m. Monday, as Sierra mentioned, is the Maker Fair, and this is our second annual Maker Fair. Awesome. It's from 6.30 to 7.30 in the Pond Cove Middle School Cafetorium. And last year we had things like snow making and a 3D printer, and uh, this year promises to be just as, if not more, exciting. So do we have a 3D year. printer? We do not yet have a 3D printer. Ooh. We applied for grants for a 3D printer. At this point, we have not received a 3D printer, but I know that um, people working on the maker space at the middle school are very enthusiastic about attempting to get a 3D printer, uh, at least edge. one. Um, next Wednesday, the 18th, Dr. Michael Shackelford will be doing his rescheduled um, presentation for parents about differentiated instruction and the components of that, and we spoke about that in February before he was rescheduled. I think those were the highlights I wanted. Oh no, and then Literacy Week, the week of April 6th, so it's before our next board meeting. Um, we have a visit on April 3rd from Jonathan London. Jonathan London wrote for parents of young children the Froggy books, um, which are really K-1 level books, but he's also written a number of nonfiction books and um, books for young adult readers now. We have 60 plus authors and illustrators confirmed for AuthorFest on April 11th. And the week of April 6th through 10th, there are events almost every evening. So on Monday the 6th, author G.A. Morgan, who wrote the book Undecided and gave a TED Talk at the high school, will be doing a presentation um, for parents and teens about career options. Um, the favorite line, I think, when, from her TED Talk was her career choice was to never have to wear pantyhose. I think that was her career ambition. <laughs> and so she'll, she'll speak to that. But again, I think um, good opportunity for middle school um, students and parents as well as high school students and parents. On Tuesday, there's a middle school concert. There's not an event. That Wednesday night, there'll be a middle school poetry slam at the local Buzz. And there are student poets who've been working with uh, a local slam poet um, named Tina Love out of Portland. And Tina Love was one of the national um, poetry slam competitors in recent years. On Thursday, there'll be a panel of um, students who've published their writing, including one of our own. And on Friday, we are very fortunate to have um, Maine illustrator and Caldecott winner Ashley Bryan um, giving a talk at the high school and he'll be joined by um, one of his longtime colleagues and friends, Tanya Stone. Um, so if you're interested in volunteering for AuthorFest or making any donations, please email us and we'll put you in touch with the right people. Making any what? Donations. Oh, okay. Anything else? I no, I think I'm done. Well, you're not done yet because we wanted to also make sure that the um, community un, um, recognized your efforts in seeking a certification in the superintendent's um, AASA's 150th anniversary celebration. And um, this was a 18 month long process of going through training and collaborating and networking with superintendents from across the country who have been in their positions, is it five or less years? Mm -hmm in order to sharpen those skills and gain the expertise and have a network of folks that you can turn to and seek advice and um, professional development opportunities because as you can appreciate by where the superintendent's position is you're the only one in a district doing that so being able to network out and being able to get in touch with the folks across the country who are implementing programs and practices that are maybe cutting edge in someone else's district and being able to see what other people are doing for the benefit of their children so that our children can in turn benefit when it comes time to competing nationally for slots for schools and for jobs and it's just an incredible self-initiative that you've taken on for yourself on top of seeking your PhD and on top of a full-time job as well as being a mom it's just you're inspirational, and I just want to really take a moment to celebrate um, your your achievement in that regard. Thank so, thank you for all you do and what you do to bring to our district. I will say it's, it was a great experience for me working with um, again superintendents from across the country for the last year and a half, um, and many of us were working on similar initiatives at the same time. So mm -hmm. there are other folks implementing full day kindergarten. There are other folks implementing one to one technology. There are other folks working on capital plans and um, you know 
trying to get bonds approved. So, you know, it's, it's been very helpful, I think, to all of us to be able to sort of build those relationships with one another, share ideas, share thinking, um, and I, I look forward to continuing to maintain those relationships. There are 27 of us from, we like to say, Maine to Alaska, um, and Sunrise, everywhere in between. Sunset. Um, who are part of this work, and um, we had the advantage of working with a great mentor, master teacher, as well as having mentors ourselves who are experienced superintendents of a variety of districts. Mine happens to be from uh, Utica, Michigan, and Dr. Christine Haynes, but I, I appreciated her support and uh, mentorship over the last couple of years as well. That's really impressive. I also noticed I took a look at the list of those who had also received the certification, and you've got a neighbor in Bill Beasley I from do. Greater Gloucester. Bruce Beasley, who, yep. Bruce Beasley, who I've had the opportunity to meet and work with briefly on some projects, and um, it's really, he's also an innovative, forward thinking new administrator who is going to do a lot of great things for. In Gloucester as well. So, and the Superintendents Association has extended this group now. There are additional cohorts that have been formed, and um, Portland Superintendent uh, Manny is Manny. Emmanuel Cock is also part of um, one of the more recent cohorts. So, the work will continue. What a fabulous consortium! Well, thank you for seeking out that opportunity and bringing the fruits yes. of that to our district. Thanks. Okay. Anything else with the superintendent's report and any questions regarding, regarding communications? Okay, uh, may I have a motion um, regarding the athletic nominations? I'm, excuse me, I move that we approve the following athletic staff nominations as listed in the agenda packet under item 6A. May I have a second? I second. Discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Thank you. May I have a motion regarding the policies for second reading? Wait a minute. Um, we just have, I have to say thank you to all the coaches who step up to do this work because I know. Um, we have one of them in the audience. I, well, not, I didn't just say it for you, Peter, but for, I, I keep meaning to say it every time and I'm a minute late every time. Um, but we know it's huge dedication for the staff to, to reach, to work with children, students beyond the school day. And that usually is why students come to school motivated, eager, uh, willing, and energized and healthy. Um, so we really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. Uh, motion? I think we need a motion. It's okay. a second reading. I move that we um, approve the policies listed under item 6B uh, as listed. Second. Second. Eight seconds. Discussion? Uh, so these are second read policies, so I talked about this at the last meeting, but just briefly, uh, JHCA, the use of unscheduled class time for high school juniors and seniors. This, the, the principal change here is that we're adding some flexibility for juniors at the request of junior class officers. Um, that would allow juniors uh, to juniors in good academic standing um, to leave campus for the last period of the day, provided that they have no scheduled class during that period. Um, for a reason I'm not totally clear of, that particular line is not um, redlined in the policy that we have in our packet. So um, I think that's the most important change in, in terms of that policy. Um, and then in terms of the uh, student travel and field trips, we did make some changes, some clarifications to the forms um, in that one is really an authorization form that has to do with getting the required approvals for the trip that need to come from the principal, the superintendent, or the school board, depending on the type of trip. And the other is the parent consent form, and so we, we, we made more clear this distinction between those two. Um, but the, the real change here is streamlining the approval process, so only the parties who need to be involved in approval of a trip are involved in approval of the trip, um, with appropriate notification and awareness at the school board level of any out-of-state travel. 
Um, so specifically, the board approves trips that are either outside of New England or any trip that requires two or more overnight stays, but other trips uh, inside of uh, inside of New England or with only one overnight stay may be approved by the superintendent. Um, and so that, that, that change um, has brought, been brought about by the fact that we've had a fair number of specially arranged special business meetings in order to approve a trip that's been very, typically very well vetted and understood by the administrators involved and uh, doesn't require, in the opinion of the committee, doesn't require um, uh, board approval. Uh, so, and then the uh, IK, IKF um, graduation requirement policy, we haven't made any changes in second read, but the, the big change there was to begin to prepare ourselves for proficiency-based uh, diploma required, as required by the state. Any comments or questions? I have one comment. Um, we, we made a change to uh, I -O, excuse me, IHOA E2, which is the parent consent form. We added a line to alert parents that you know, they should get health insurance, um, which is important. Uh, we decided not to require it, but just to alert them it's their responsibility. But I would, I would suggest that we add in the words health insurance between the words obtain and coverage, because it's, it's a little bit easier for people to understand they need to get health insurance coverage rather than just coverage, since it's a fairly important thing. Mm -hmm. That's a question for the motion maker. <laughs> well, I would, I would request that we amend the motion to prove as <coughs> listed with that, adding the words health insurance between the words obtain and coverage on IO, IHOA E2. Is there a second to the amendment? Yes. Speed. Okay, it's a second. Discussion? Well, it's, it would appear to me that coverage for medical expenses means you're agreeing that you're responsible for medical expenses, whether they ultimately are paid by an insurance company or paid by a family. The point is that the responsibility for me the medical expenses of the child uh, while the child is on the field trip are the, are the, is the responsibility of the family. It's, well, if we're asking for insu health insurance coverage, that's, that's a little bit different. But we're... In that case, would it be not the wordsmith, but uh, obtain means, you know, to, to go out and acquire or purchase something. Where Are we just saying, I understand that it's my responsibility to cover any medical expenses? In other words, are we saying that the responsibility of the parent, that if there's any medical expenses, they're responsible. Well, even that's not technically right because a parent isn't responsible if they purchase insurance. I mean, this, we, we could massage this to death. Personally, it was just simply a notification. It doesn't say that you're required to do it. It says that we're notifying this there that, that they, should, they should do this because we're not, there may be medical expenses and they're out of state and you're going to have to take care of them. I personally think the words health insurance should be in there because um, I don't know too many people that can pay medical expenses out of pocket. That, and, it, and it is just a suggestion, but I don't really want a wordsmith. I think the words health insurance should be in there, but if nobody wants it, I don't care. I, I'm, I'm, I'm okay with it. Yeah. I, I'm not, I, I just wanted to understand, I guess. The yeah, difference, it, the, um, the difference is what I'm trying to alert people People do not understand, this is something we discussed, do not understand when a kid leaves the state, then health insurance may or may not cover a problem. So we're just simply telling them, be aware, guys, that we're not guaranteeing we can cover. You guys should check your insurance to make sure you're covered if something happens. And that's what people do. That's why, that's all we're trying to do there. Okay, so I'm, I'm comfortable with the amendment proposed. Mm -hmm. So should we vote on the amendment and then vote on the package? Okay, so all of those in favor of the amended as David had specified by specifying health insurance? Okay. Any other further discussion in regards to the um, policies that are up for second read? Questions? 
All those in favor of the packet? Do you have a question? I have a question. And um, I think I, I just want to make sure I asked it last time. With the students um, leaving, the juniors leaving, we, Jeff was in the rooms. Jeff, um, this will not add to extra burden on the administration to um, take care of children. You're, you're okay with these changes. Thank you very much. Okay. Any other questions or comments? All those in favor? Thank you. May I have a motion? No. I'm sorry. It's a first read. Um, John, as policy chair, would you like to tell us about policies under um, item C? Sure. Uh, JFABB, the Foreign Exchange Student Program, we encourage uh, foreign exchange students who attend uh, typically high school in Cape Elizabeth. Uh, uh, the, the, uh, what I learned, which I think is worth sharing, is that the, the, the bottleneck for making this happen is typically host families. So um, the availability of host families is what makes possible uh, the, the, our ability to, to host exchange students in the school, um, which I think brings um, value to all of our students um, who can't all spend a, a, a year in another country uh, to have someone from somewhere else. Uh, so this, this policy allows for that to happen. Um, the, the major uh, change has to do with um, the, the requirement for English language competency. Uh, for those exchange students. Um, I think we, uh, based on comments of one of the committee members that I got right before the meeting, we may need to wordsmith the, the, the change that's proposed here um, in order to make sure that it's consistent with the law because we do have a requirement to provide services for any student in our district once they're a student in our district. Uh, so we want to make sure that we're our policy is consistent with the law, of course. Um, but the, the, the uh, goal here really is, is that there are agencies that are involved in uh, placing exchange students. Those agencies commit to uh, placing students who have competency in English so that they can benefit from our instruction, which is typically in English. Um, and uh, we're trying to put a little um, some teeth into the into their into our request and their commitment that these students are are capable of benefiting from uh, our class classroom uh, instruction in English. So that's the point of that um, change. Um, the uh, policy J F A B D. The education of homeless students. Uh, I'm not aware of significant changes to that policy coming out of first read. I'm curious why they changed to the title from admission to the education of homeless students. Uh, I, I don't think admission is a is a is a. I don't know why the change actually, but. So maybe you can. I would just say I because I think the, po the policy spoke more broadly to. Our responsibility to educate those students than simply to our responsibility to admit the door. Admission is not an issue for residents right. of Cape Elizabeth, so it's not, so there are other issues um, that are addressed in the policy, but admission to, to public school is not is not the issue. Um, is not admission based on residency? It is. So, well, when you're homeless, residency it may doesn't not require be home, home, uh, residency. You know, a home of your own. And if you were a resident of Cape Elizabeth and become homeless, you may still be eligible to attend school in Cape Elizabeth under the law. So, there are a variety of factors. And you may become a resident of Cape Elizabeth, where, where having previously had a home in another district and so true. under those circumstances. You may become a resident in Cape Elizabeth, but at the same time you become homeless, right? When I crash on your couch. Um, and so uh, at, th there's eligibility um, to attend school in, in Cape Elizabeth under those sorts of circumstances too. 
Thank you. Um, uh, policy uh, JLF, reporting of child ab abuse and, and neglect. This is um, largely defined by law, this policy. And um, the change, I, I'm, I believe that the changes that have been made have been made in order to keep the policy consistent with the law. If we, if we have comments on that one, we emailed you just the, the definition of child abuse or neglect. Yes, if you, if you have any comments on any policies under, under consideration by the policy committee, please submit them to me uh, in advance of the next policy meeting, um, and we will address them in the policy committee. Thank you. Thank you for your work in that committee. Quick comment, yeah. Meredith, if, um, to Meredith, if she'd carry back to Andrea. We really threw a lot of changes at her that day, and she handled them really well. So thanks to Andrea. Yes. I, I will certainly convey that, and we do appreciate it. And um, yes, she's, she has a lot thrown at her every day. She is. <laughs> I am constantly in awe skilled. of Andrea's ability to handle the multitude of extreme amount of detail and never seems to be flustered. It must be a joy to have her around. That's because she is. was trained at Berlin Dana first and she can put a bunch of lawyers, that's school system to nothing. We did our best to throw her that afternoon and she was great. So. <laughs> there is no flustering. <laughs> no. Um, item D, may I have a motion around the school board goals? I move that we adopt the 2015 school board goals as presented in our packet. Second. Second. Thank you, Barbara. Discussion? I just want to ask, how did I do in capturing all of the uh, suggestions that were posed last month? Well, I, for one, wrote back and, and thank uh, Joe for really capturing, I thought, where we were headed. I like the intro. I think the, the goals. Uh, in this sort of framework under vision goals, policy, resources, et cetera, is, makes it abundantly clear. I can't take, take credit for the, the layout. It was a suggestion that came from Chairman Christie. Yep. So his suggestion molded into your format worked very nicely. Thank you. I have um, just two little suggestions. Yes, please. They're very little. <laughs> they are. Um, under number eight, uh, I, I think there's a really important constituency for the website, um, which is the taxpayer. Um, and I, I, because, and, and we're in the middle of the budget process, so it's very clear why, that, why that's the case. Um, the, the clarity of the, um, the presentation of the information in the budget is obviously the, of primary importance to the taxpayer. Um, but I think also an understanding of what, what is happening at the schools um, throughout the year. Uh, and what's, how is, not, not just, you know, what are the line items that the, that the, the funding is being attributed to, but the, the, the website is an opportunity to, to portray for the taxpayer what's being done with that fund, with, the, with those funds. Um, and and um, so I think it'd be important to add that constituent. Sorry, now I'm not being brief. Can I change that slightly? Because um, I I'm agree have to with. Separate you two over there. I, I I agree with John, but the better word to add would be uh, residents, because the residents are the ones who vote on the budget. You don't have to be a taxpayer; you just have to be a resident. A community members, something. Yeah, I'm okay with anything that that represents a stakeholder group. Of Other than people that teachers and parents, citizens outside of um, okay. those three, and then. Just on 10, there's just a missing E in the first word. But. Create? I found that. Create. <laughs> hey, it passed spell check. I missed it. Can I have a comment? Oh, are you ready? Um, yeah, we have vision, and just in terms of, I, I like everything about it. I was just trying to say, in the, the top, it's called our goals, and then above two, we have the word goals. So was that specific strategic plan goals? Just yeah. 
Yes. Okay. So it might be, if, you know, if that's a specific, uh, you know, strategic plan goal, that'd be more, just to mm -hmm. differentiate. But I think this is fantastic. Thank you for spearheading this, Joe, and being willing for uh, new ideas, various perspectives, and constructive solutions. Thank that's you. what we're all about. Any other comments or questions? Um, I do on uh, accountability and communication and number nine. Um, I was I've been beginning to see as we are asking for um, community members to be more proactive in their communication to us mm -hmm. that I, I think we might be missing our fundamental um, step of, is that there is a process of communication and that we communicate through the uh, the chair is the person who communicates to uh, stake, stake to res, you know, when we have questions. And then Meredith is the person who communicates to the board through um, teachers and administration. And so, and then she speaks to us about So I just want to, I didn't know if I should ask it as an agenda item to go through the protocol again to make sure we're all clear. We want to do two-way communication. But we also don't, um, we want to be able to answer, and the person who can best answer is the school board chair and our, su our superintendent first, and our school board chair. You know, so that's... So I, I think, Kate, part of what you're raising is sort of the, the protocol for, if you have an issue with your teacher, you talk to the teacher. If you, it's not resolved at that level, you talk with the building administrator. If it's not resolved at that level, you talk to the superintendent. If it's not resolved at that level, you come to the school board. Is that yes. what you're getting at? So there is a policy um, that speaks to that a little bit about sort of the public complaint process. And maybe the policy committee could look at that policy as a step yep. toward addressing, I think, that concern you're raising. It's just a thought. Yeah, that's the one. And then the other the piece, so in the spirit of this, um, because in, in the spirit of this, the only one who can give the real answer. Um, so we can always do talk, but when we bring it to the school board level, we, it's all, we are, everyone, I have my opinion and I can ask questions about my opinion, but I certainly don't speak for the school board. And so I just... I appreciate what you're raising, and I think the spirit of number nine is what I've encouraged since the beginning of my tenure as chair is we as school board members are ambassadors for our district, and I encourage anyone and everyone from teachers to parents to students to talk to school board members and school board members to talk to members of the community not to speak for the board but perhaps to be ambassadors for what's happening in the school district help people understand why we're doing what we're doing and help answer and clarify perhaps questions in the strategic plan or what's happening with smarter balance or some of the initiatives in the school that people might have questions about but then if there's um, if it rises to above that level, I think that what you're considering might kick in is there's a protocol for things that if someone has more of a just a, more than just a clarifying question, but they have a real concern, then I think the protocol question might then supersede yes. that. Yes. Does that help clarify the spirit of that? How I view number nine is written? Which, for those of you who might not be reading, um, says, says promote two-way communication and foster positive school climate. Just to chime in, I, I read it much broader than the protocol. In other words, it's, you know, it's in, in two-way communication, you know, among not only school board, but, you know, broader within the district and, you know, foster positive school climate. So, you know, I don't think, at, at, at this stage, we don't have to tease out the specific action items in the agenda. So, you know, I think it's okay if we maybe one can define it broader and one a, another scenario could be narrower. So, I don't think we have to decide right now. You know, you know, does it mean sharing the protocol or posting the protocol on the website? I think we can defer that to when we you know, address how we're going to achieve some of these goals. 
I would agree with Michael. I think the, um, the issue of how we communicate to the public and how we have administration communicate to the public and how we communicate to administration is very important. I think we have to constantly revisit that. But I think that's the level of detail that we should talk about and it should be in policy, procedure, or protocols, or whatever. Um, we know what it is and we've seen it, but um, I think at that level is the best place to put it. But a very valid, good point. No, that, that, that's great. It's just, worth revisiting. Because yeah. I want to keep it, the positive school climate is the key. And so. Right. And, in, and as ambassadors, I think right. that that's a big part of your role as a school board member. Any other questions or comments? Um, so, does anyone want to amend their motion to reflect the changes that were suggested? Uh, I guess I made the motion. Yes, I think that's even okay. So the changes that were were. I move to approve uh, really Elizabeth Cooper goals as amended in our discussion. And, and the amendments in the discussion are, I can remember my two. And adding a spell check correction. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Did, Mike, did Michael make a, a change? Uh, oh, the strategic oh. plan uh, goals, right. Exactly. Okay. Uh, so um, I'm comfortable with the amendment. Should we vote on the amendment? Well, I think we can just vote on it all at once. Okay. Then, uh... Technically, you can't, but it's okay. Oh. So you've amended your motion? I've amended the motion to include those three changes. Second. Barbara, Michael. Discussion? All those in favor? Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm looking forward to achieving those goals in the coming year. Uh, item number seven on our agenda, committee reports. I believe policy committee is pretty well covered. Um, do we have any other committee reports? No, I would just say out loud to Kate that I noticed in the school nutrition program there were some items for wellness and policy. So John and Kate, we need to probably look at some language updates through that committee. Um, I'm going to just run through and maybe jog some memory here. Um, the committee appointments to the Cape Elizabeth Education Foundation was Barbara Powers. I don't right. know if there's been much going on. I have. Um, there was actually a meeting the night of the school board workshop, but I had written again and asked the director if she was going to do an orientation for me before I attended, and she thought she was going to ask the liaison reps to come more like four times a year instead of every meeting. So hopefully I'll be meeting with her soon. Excellent. Um, Maine School Management Association delegate, that would be Barbara and the alternative states. Mm -hmm. You guys have been a little bit busy writing. That's the, the legis legislative liaison piece. Oh, sorry. I did want to ask a question, and I don't know if you saw my email yet, Meredith, but David mentioned that uh, MPA is once again looking to see if boards would like to sponsor um, a motion asking the governor to, in budget, to watch what he, what's happening for local education funding. And I didn't know if you all had done that in the past. Have you approved a motion before? Not last year. I think two years ago there was a resolution from the board. Yeah, we have done it on a, on, on a specific occasion. I don't remember if it was the one they're referring to, but we have done it. And, um, um, I, I think we don't have time. When do they want it done by? I, I don't, I don't know, know the answer you to that. Along. I, I think, that I think it's getting late. I thought it was Maine Municipal that was looking about the revenue sharing issue because general purpose aid has, sounds like it's been determined already to an extent. So I wasn't sure if it was kind of after the fact for us, but that just came through today. Yeah, and David's and it was, suggestion. Um, it was, I um, can't remember the name of the organization uh, that sent it. Maine School Management. Came from Maine School Management. Right. Yeah. Maine People's Alliance. Maine People's Alliance Maine People's is the one. Alliance. So. Um. Mm -hmm. It almost seems more like a council 
motion than a school board motion, perhaps at this time, if their focus is revenue sharing. Exactly. That's what it sounds like to me. Mm -hmm. How about I forward it to Mr. McGovern to see if they'd like to consider it at that level? I think that was. Anyone? We just have one person. What you're suggesting yeah. makes sense. So okay. Because it does seem to be like so we, that might be where yeah. that belongs at this point in the process. Okay. I, I, I'm sorry. I, I thought we had, maybe I'm mistaken, but I remember that being a delegate to the uh, Main School Management Association was not the. Oh, is this, this for is the, the legislative school? liaison? A legislative liaison was more than one person in the past. Correct. Yeah. That's Barbara. Kate. Right. This year is Barbara. Barbara's the legislative liaison. I think Joe spoke about main school management. That's that body I wasn't meeting until October. You did. SMA. And then I said, oh, no, I'm sorry. When I brought up the topic of what was happening in the legislature, I meant to say legislative liaison. Well, I, Do you have a question? That doesn't matter. I, I thought we had, uh, <clears throat> Barbara was, this is not important, but it, Barbara was the delegate, and Kate was the alternate for Main School Management Association, but that is a legislative in the fall concert with Rebecca and other right. people was more than one person. We only have one legislative liaison. Okey doke. Which also happens to be Barbara. Okay. Well, my suggestion, and I think in the past I asked for authority before I went and filed something, which is what uh, right. Barbara may be talking about. Right. Um, because I didn't feel it was appropriate for me to file something, and I usually would prepare something or whatever. I've only worked with Meredith on one piece so far that's come Around up. teacher evaluation. Right. The postponement due, and that may not be able so to. My happen. suggestion on that one is you might want to figure out what it is that they want, talk to Meredith, and mm -hmm. figure out if there's something we want to do or not, or present to the board and recommend that we do. That's what I did. Okay. I think that process makes sense. Thank you for bringing that up, David. So in the case of the main school management and the revenue sharing, then perhaps also present right. something. Okay. Thank you, David. Um, negotiations are busy. We have two, if not really three, sets of negotiations still ongoing. We have the administrators um, association. We have the, see if I can get this right, Ed text one and two in secretarial staff negotiations. And we also have the um, food service, maintenance, bus drivers, and <coughs> the re no. A text raises with the other group. With the other group. Of facilities. See, I told you I wouldn't be able to answer. Custodial, right. food service, maintenance, bus drivers. Okay. So those are ongoing. Um, we hope to wrap those up on their schedule path. Um, any other committees that wish to? Teacher evaluation. Sure. Um, and I always ask for help from Meredith. Teach evaluation uh, is meeting monthly, and we have Anita Stewart McCaffrey. Can you say her name again? It might be McCaffrey Stewart. Right, right, right. That's Stewart. Yeah. Who is a USM um, professor who is working on teacher evaluations and does um, a very nice job moving us along on the um, on that work. Uh, we had a nice, uh, we had a great uh, workshop with Kim Marshall, who came, who was very, it was a four-hour workshop, uh, a okay. half-day half, all day workshop, um, who did a great job, and not only people from the Teacher Evaluation Committee was there, but every, uh, most people invited other members of the school, so there was a great question-answer and period that um, everyone got to give input and it was great discussion and then we brought that work back to teach evaluations to keep moving along um, it's a lot of heavy lifting it, it, um, it's a nice conversation it's a nice conversation and uh, Ruth Ellen uh, brings in all changes from the state on a regular Ruth Ellen and Meredith bring make sure that all changes are we're working with deadlines, changing deadlines, and changing format. How was that, how was that Meredith? That sums it up, or? I would say. There could be more. We could go on forever yeah, about that. I think the board should expect to see a draft plan by um, probably the May meeting in order to have that turned around and sent off to the state by the end of May. 
Do we have a currently required by the law. Okay. And is there a deadline for adopting an evaluation system? That would be. That would be it. That would be the. And then the effective date for that evaluation system would be. Well, our, our intent is to pilot a system for next year, and then to fully implement in the ensuing school year, so 16-17. And which positions would be affected by this evaluation plan? It's all teachers and all principals. Thank you. Yep. Um, nice to hear that coming along. Um, paths? Anything happening there? Oh, right, no, no. Okay. Wellness? We've really heard a lot about wellness and, and food. Wellness is intending to sort of start up once we wrap up budget, so hopefully in early April. Okay. Um, technology Steering Committee, Michael Moore, and anything really yeah, happening? We're, we're right on track. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Transportation Appeals Committee? None yet. Okay. Well, we have one, but um, no new since the snow. Okay. Buildings and grounds? We're, we're right on track. <laughs> 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 and then, of course, we have our advisory committee. We've heard about the uh, legislative liaison with Barbara Powers. We have our dropout prevention committee, formerly the positive action committee with John. Any action over there? Well, <laughs> I, I, as you're aware, I, I was interested in some information that came forward in one of our meetings about, the, about truancy, which is an a, a, a early indicator of potentially of, of a student who might not complete, complete school. So um, I think we'll um, get that on an agenda at a future meeting and, ha and get some more information about how we, how we yeah. respond when those uh, indications come forward. I think it's a broader question about attendance and not just truancy. Truancy is fairly rare, but attendance in and of itself is an Clearly, early- Clearly truancy year. is a term of art that I don't understand. That. <laughs> All I meant was attendance. Yes. <laughs> Very well. Um, community Services Advisory Board. Uh, right on track. Right on track. <laughs> <laughs> and lastly, the Innovations Team with Susanna and John. We'll Things be meeting rolling. tomorrow night, uh, which will be um, the first one since uh, the end of the year. And um, going to start rolling. And have, we'll have more to say next time. I, I'm, I'm looking forward to the 3D printer. If I never... Well, I don't know. Okay, thank you um, for the committee report outs. Um, next item on our agenda is the school board agenda requests. If you do have any before the Thursday, the, what is the date? We, we want to know the beginning of April. Yes. So, yes, I don't know when the beginning of April, the first, but somewhere oh, gosh, in that ballpark. No. Yeah, yeah we'd be ideally like to know by the third, third. Or yeah. first or second of April if there are any other agenda requests. We can accommodate those if we make those requests by April 1st. Um, are there any announcements of upcoming meetings that we should share at this point? Yes, we have our next budget workshop uh, one week from tonight, March 17th. It'll be at 630 in the Cape Elizabeth High School Library and Learning Commons. Um, the Topics under discussion are available on the budget website. Um, but to make it clear, the items uh, from our last budget workshop on March 3rd, instructional support, preschool, salary and benefits, and staffing, we did not complete those discussions. So we have a new budget workshop we scheduled for March 19th. So all the items from the last one, instructional sports, preschool, salary and benefits and staffing will be completed at a new March 19th workshop. Um, the best place to get all the information is go to the school website, click on budget. On the right hand, you'll see a calendar. If you click on those dates, it has the agenda items under discussion. But just one more time, the items we did not complete, instructional support, Preschool salary benefits and staffing will be discussed at the new workshop, which will be uh, Thursday, March 19th. Thank you, Michael. Yep. Um, heavy lifting over there in the finance department. Right on schedule. That's right. 
Barbara. I didn't get my hand up in time on the agenda request thing, and I don't have a specific, I just wanted us to be reminded of, I think maybe you were the only one that weighed in, Michael, but about our, you know, hearing from principals in a regular way about strategic plan implementation and how certainly we don't want to ask each of them to stand up each meeting and do that wonderful piece they did for us last month, but perhaps from his suggestions or you and Meredith chatting with the DLT or however you want to do that, how we might <coughs> get some regular updates about strategic plan uh, successes, challenges, updates. That'd be great. Thank you for that reminder. Mm -hmm. You're all noticed. So I just said one thing that I forgot during my report, and it was at the top of my list, but somehow I started with calendar. So. Um, just one thing that I wanted to share with the board is that you know, we've, we've heard some um, concern from faculty around school climate and um, you know I know the board uh, talked about a letter from the association um, that addressed some of those concerns and so one of the things that I talked to the DLT about is bringing in a consultant to do some work in the district to sort of identify what those concerns are and try to tease them out and um, I, you know, give some suggestions on how to move forward. So um, I'm in the process right now of trying to find some potential consultants to come in and do that work. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot going on in this district, a lot of great work that people are doing. And um, you know, I, I think to the extent that people are distracted, concerned, stressed, anxious, overwhelmed, any or all of the above, I think it's important for us to kind of take a look at that and, and figure out how to support them and help move forward. So um, we'll be looking at ways to address that. And again, I've, I've got a short list of names at this point um, to begin doing some work, and I'm sure I will have some more. But we'll hopefully be able to have that uh, work going on by the end of the month. Um, I just want to say I applaud you for taking that work on um, head on. I, I know that there has been definitely feedback that I think that we've all heard at one point or another around um, implementing a, a, a very um, aggressive strategic plan underneath, also having to conform to common core standards and proficiency-based grading and differentiating instruction and all of the other myriad of changes that all seem to have even more so than in the past, all seem to hit at once. And um, change is hard under the best of circumstances when it's only one or two. But if it's five or six changes that are happening at once, um, the symptoms of those changes can, um, if gone unaddressed, can, can fester and become worse. And it takes, I think, an enormous amount of courage to um, pull your bootstraps up and, and look at them right on. So uh, I. I, for one, applaud the effort. I think it's great. I think it makes sense, and especially at this point. And thank you for going in that direction. It's smart. I, I would say that it's not necessarily courage. It's just competency. If we have issues, we hire someone to figure it out. Um, I don't, quite frankly, I assume that this expert or consultant will be able to help us run in the especially the superintendent run the school system, uh, find out what the issues are, figure out solutions. And it's, I, I don't mean to say it isn't smart or it isn't strategic, I think it is, but it's not really courage. It's really the work you do. I don't know why I bothered to make that distinction, but I did. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, there is, a, there, is a reason why, it, there is a reason why I did it, but I'm being obtuse and I don't feel like not. <laughs> Explaining it. We appreciate that. <laughs> um, may I have a motion to adjourn? <laughs> I move that we adjourn. <laughs> Second. Second. All those in favor? Third. Seven. Thank you so much.